Welcome to Ephri Lethbridge's live stream. We're so glad you've taken the chance to join us for this week's service. Maybe somebody invited you here today, or maybe you just happened to find us through the webpage, or maybe something is keeping you away from church today. No matter where you're at, we're happy you're with us. Together, we're going to experience a few songs from our band and a message from one of our speakers. Overall, we're going to spend about 70 minutes together. You'll get a chance to hear a little bit about what God is doing in our church, and this time on the screen is just a snapshot of who we are. If you're watching this on a mobile device, but you have a computer nearby, maybe take the time to switch over because the browser is going to give you your best experience. But download the eFree app on your mobile device so you have the bulletin there and a place to take notes while our speaker is sharing. We're about to get started. We're looking forward to another great experience together with the live stream at eFree. We're going to see you again after the service wraps up. start the service. Let's sing. I know there's lots more people coming in yet. We can get started. Here we go. would be known. We'd sense your Holy Spirit in us, changing us from the inside out. Father, help us be open to you, open to your voice speaking to us, open to your hands changing and softening our hearts. Help this morning be all about you. Oh, we welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Let every heart adore. Let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you.
here is hidden, you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall now.
Hey, I'm Chris. We're here at the Christmas Dinner Theater. Let's go see what's going on. Jim, yes. um, what is your role tonight here at the Christmas Dinner Theater? I play Jack Weeb. I'm the father of the uh, three children. And uh, we're struggling. Uh, we've been, uh, the mind shut down. We've had to do different things. And so uh, there's been some tension within the family and we're trying to reconcile things at Christmas. Okay, that sounds pretty intense. I'm really excited. Cool, good to meet you, Guy. What are you most excited for tonight? Um, the play. The play sounds amazing, fantastic, and also share this moment with my friends. Cool, thanks, Guy. Tell me your names. My name's Bailey. My name's Brianna. My name is Rachel. My name's Amy. My name's Taylor. Sophie. Good to meet you all. What are you most excited for tonight? Everything. What are you excited for? The play. Excited for dessert. Oh, dessert. Me too. High five. Christmas. Christmas. Thanks, guys. High five. Okay, we're here with Myrna. And Myrna, you guys got some pretty good seats. You guys booked a couple tables. Tell us a little bit. Four. Four tables. We booked four tables. That's awesome. Tell us tell us why you booked four tables with your small group. We had been encouraging our, um, our community group to be inviting people from their, whether they're friends, their neighbors, co-workers, anybody that they were communi uh, connecting with. So um, that's what we had them do. And when it got to November 1st, we had enough for four tables to be booked. That's so awesome. And that's really the purpose behind this whole event is to connect people, connect people who come here, who don't come here. So hope you have a great evening. Okay, guys, I'm Chris. That's all for tonight. You can still get tickets for later this week. Go at the church office or online. We'll hopefully see you there. Merry Christmas. That's so cute. What do you like best? Christmas. That's a great answer. Uh, we have the Christmas dinner theater is going strong. We had two performances yesterday in the afternoon and the evening. I've heard rave reviews about the food, and I've heard rave reviews about the place. So if you get a chance, we'd love for you to come. Have a unique opportunity this afternoon to um, join us, and uh, Nathaniel will tell you a little bit about that. So I'm going to invite Jess and Nathaniel and Gwen up. This is a great opportunity. Mark Dick is um, speaking to us today, and I am always reminded because Mark has these things that he says all the time, and one of them is um, we're better together and we need each other. So he says them all the time. He hashtags it, and uh, this is a reminder to me yesterday as we were serving. What a great opportunity to get to know other people. I met some people that I've never met before, so great to serve together and great uh, opportunity for people to come and bring their friends and their family and their neighbors and their coworkers. We have a couple things going on. One is this weekend that's coming up, and it's a live nativity event at the exhibition. We've had a great invitation there, and Jess is um, heavily involved in that, and she's um, leading the charge on arranging everybody for that. So Jess, can you tell us a little bit about the live nativity and um, what kinds of things are happening there, and how do we get to be involved in that space? Okay, so as most of you probably know, uh, the exhibition hosts, uh, it's called the Big Christmas Trade Show. And three years ago, we were invited as a church community to come um, tell the story of Jesus being born in a manger, which is amazing that we were invited to the secular space um, to tell the story of our faith. And um, we get to do that again this year. And because 65 of us said yes to, 65 plus, I think, said yes to helping, um, we get to go and proclaim Jesus' name in this public setting and tell the story of hope and joy and peace and love that we celebrate um, at this time of year. Um, yeah, the, the trade show is full of vendors, people selling um, things and people buying things. Kids can visit Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus. Kids can decorate cookies. There's lots of different kind of activities happening throughout the event. But as they're walking around, they get to hear Jesus' name proclaimed, which is really cool that we as a church community are trusted with this and get to have an opportunity um, to do this. It's a way to invite people into our faith in one small way. Um, yeah, so come out. There's three uh, performances on Friday afternoon and three on Saturday. Um, so if you want to check it out, come uh, support your friends that are stepping outside of their comfort zone and acting like a shepherd or a wise man or Mary and Joseph or baby Jesus. Um, so yeah, that's what's kind of happening next weekend. That's great. Do we have goats? 
We have goats. You can't resist a goat. <laughs> I have, uh, watch out, they head by. But no, they're really nice goats, so come out and visit the goats. What a great opportunity we have. And I believe they are still looking for a Joseph for Friday. I'm not sure if it has age limitations. But if you're willing to put on something, you don't have to say any lines. They will direct you and tell you where to stand. There's a narrator who reads the story, and you just kind of get to walk along. So looking for a Joseph, I believe, on Friday. This is Nathaniel Kaniski. I met him last week. Uh, Nathaniel is looking after so many of the details, which is incredible, incredible to me, who is not a detail person. So I appreciate his involvement. And Nathaniel's involved in the areas of the food and the serving and coordinating volunteers. So Nathaniel, how is Dinner Theatre going? And how many performances have we done? How many are coming yet? And are there still opportunities for people to serve? So we're two performances in. So we've done uh, two yesterday, a matinee and a dinner, which went really well. And uh, we've had a lot of positive feedback, and it's been very exciting. We've got seven left, because we're doing nine total performances. We have a matinee today, and it's the only time we're doing this, is we are doing tickets at the door for the matinee today at uh, 2.30. So feel free, come get your tickets, join us. We have a ton of cheesecake and cake to still give out. So come on out, get some food, enjoy the play. It'll be a great time. Uh, we still could use a couple volunteers tonight. I'm looking for like two more people to maybe join the Dish Pit crew for the 5.30 show. We'll see. That would be maybe a little bit helpful. Uh, other than that, we're pretty full for the rest of the week, but we will always take the extra help. I will find a place for you to serve. Uh, yeah. That's great. So if people are interested in serving, what should they do? Where should they go next? Well, just contact me. If you, if you want to serve, just get a hold of me. I don't know how you do that. But. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you can email the, uh, the church. Email the church. Talk to us at the info desk. I'm making this up as I go along. Talk to the info desk or email the church, and we'll get you connected with Nathaniel and find a spot for you to serve. Last up is Gwen, and Gwen has been involved in many years. There has been a team of women who've been doing um, an event like this for about 15 years, and uh, I got get to be grafted into this team of women. So, Gwen, can you tell us a little bit about your role what you've been doing and how, what ways that you've been involved and also why do you think this matters? Thanks, Glenda. Um, I think like most of us here, I have a hard time approaching someone and sharing my faith, sharing that with the coworkers. This wall of fear appears and I have a tough time getting through that. So one of the reasons when I was recruited uh, 15 years ago for this event by Connie, um, we worked closely with it, uh, is that it's an opportunity to break down that wall. So we started here at the church one night and then two nights. And then when we outgrew the church, we went to one night at the lodge to two nights at the lodge and actually outgrew the lodge with the event. Um, but then due to circumstances, uh, we decided not to do the lodge anymore. At that point, I was approached by worship um, arts if we would partner with them. They liked our model that we used where it's very intentional. You invite your friend, your family member, your coworker. You pick them up and bring them. You sit with them at the table. You have a conversation. So the focus is not on whether it's a speaker or it's a play or it's a musical or what your personal preference is. It's the tool the church is providing for us, the vehicle to present the gospel in a clear manner and open the conversation that you can have with your friends and family. And um, bringing it back to the church makes it more intimate makes it um, more intentional about who you do invite because there's maybe a little limited on the number of seats or for a particular night, but it is so worthwhile to make that connection with your friends. It is a great tool for us to invite our neighbors and our coworkers just to say, come into my space, into my home, into our third space that we have here. We're just going to take a minute and pray for these events that are coming up this week. God, we're grateful for these tools that we have, these ways that you have given us, these methods that aren't the means in those, of themselves, but God, or aren't the end of themselves, but the means. And God, we pray that in all of these ways and all of these spaces, at our live nativity, at our dinner theaters, God, that your name would be proclaimed. Thank you for the invitation into our community, into the lives of other people. Thank you that from our delight and our freedom and our knowing of you, we get an overflow. And that overflow spills out amongst us, God. And that we get to, in that overflow, use this method. So God, I pray that as we go, that you remind us to 
pray for the dinner theater and the nativity. Pray that they would be little seeds that are planted. And God, we know that you grow those seeds. So would you take these offerings with open hands, God? Would you take even the tired hands and the hands that are serving, and would you make them open and trusting? God, I pray that this would be a blessing. It would be a blessing in people's lives, a blessing in our community, and God, a blessing to us in our church. Thank you that you lead and direct. In your name, amen. All right, church, uh, my name is Chris. I'm an intern here, and I uh, get to the privilege of reading scripture with you guys this morning. If you have a Bible and, or a phone and you want to follow along, we're going to be in James chapter 5. We're going from th- verse 13 down to verse 20. Just as you flip there, um, just some words that a former pastor of mine always used to encourage me with is that when we open up the Word of God, we, we not only expect to hear God speaking here in a book, but in our actual lives. And so I pray as, we, as Mark comes up to speak and as we read scripture that uh, we would see God in working in our lives. So this is James chapter 5, starting in verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for you, Mark. Off. God, we're so thankful for you. Uh, we're so thankful for your grace. God, we're, uh, just as Mark comes and, and speaks, Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts to, to receive it. God, no matter where we're at, give him the words to speak your truth, your uh, life into our lives. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. It's so great to be together with you. Um, I love being in front of you. I love being able to share scripture together. Uh, it's just a great time for us to be uh, in the word together, to learn together. Uh, this is the last message uh, from James before we start into our Advent season which is crazy to think that Christmas is going to be here, but we've talked about all these Christmas things, and so next week we're going to, we're going to head into an Advent message theme. But the beauty is I, I think that God has used this series to change us. I've been able to pray with some of you. I've heard stories. I've, I've read connection cards and emails and, and saw places and, and know that God has met you. Know that God has changed you and that he's, he's spoken to you through the series, which is awesome. And I'm glad to hear that, that God is convicting and changing and transforming lives and restoring relationships. This is good stuff, church. We believe in and we follow and we acknowledge and we trust in. We have faith that on our journeys, God is going to meet us. He's going to continue to change us. He's going to continue to transform us and restore us. None of us have completed the journey None of us have finished it. None of us have arrived yet, but we're under transformation. The transforming work of the grace of God is happening in our lives. Church, this uh, whole series is personal too. It's been convicting for me. Uh, God has changed me and he's challenged me. He's continued to work in my life as well. 
I, like all of you, are in the process of transformation. I've been challenged to understand that the heart of transformation is, is my heart, that God is changing my inside. It's not just about changing my actions and the things that I do, but it's about changing what's inside of me, and God wants that and cares about that, and the restoration that's happening is real. So my prayer, church, is that it continues to happen, that our transformation continues, that God continues to work in the the restoration, redemption of lives. My prayer is that this series has reminded you of parts of your lives that need transformation, parts of your lives that God has used to this series to change those pieces. I'll be honest with you, I was supposed to speak a few weeks ago, uh, and I switched with Luke. Luke is at the Great Cup. He wanted to watch the Stampeders lose in their home province. <laughs> hey, isn't that cool? So... <laughs> <laughs> that, so, uh, that was for you Stan Peters fans. Um, but I was changed with Luke. Luke came to me a couple weeks ago, and I was supposed to do, when we put together the series uh, on James, there was a message, and you remember a couple weeks ago, James spoke on the taming of the tongue. That was supposed to be my message. For those of you that know me, that would have been the right message. Hey, shh. whoa, that's a bit personal. But, uh, you know, I, so he came to me and said, Mark, I got tickets for the Great Cup. And I said, okay, why don't I switch with you? Thinking, yes, I don't have to do that message. But God, in his, like, infinite wisdom, he's, again, smarter than me, again, reminded me that he's smarter than me. Not only did I not have to prepare that message, but I sat and listened to that message, so convicted once. And I had to prepare another message today, even more convicting. So... Uh, this has been a personal conviction, a transformation, um, and God is working in my life, and he's changing me, and I, and I pray that that's the same for you. So today we, we land in chapter 5. We started in chapter 5 last week, and we're going to finish the series today in chapter 5. I don't think that James wrote it, wrote, 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 chapter 1, 2, 3, all the way through 4, and then did this standalone sort of little passage at the end, hey, i got to finish this, 20 verses seems like a good amount, and so he filled in an extra 7 verses. But this chapter flows out of the whole book. The chapter from uh, James doesn't seem to contradict what he said in the rest of the book. It doesn't seem to be different. It doesn't seem to, to speak against what he talked about in chapter 4. But it goes in the same direction. And his theme of transformation and restoration of the whole person keep on going. He doesn't only in this passage talk about a physical transformation, a physical fix. And it's not only a spiritual fix that he's talking about, and it's not only something you can do alone. The things that he's talked about in the whole, the whole chapter. James has the idea, the picture uh, of the whole transformation in mind, the whole person, spiritual, physical, and emotional. And he also reminds the reader that in this last part of it, that you can't also do it alone. You need other people, you need to gather, but you need God for this transformation, he goes back to that. I love this passage, and it's a passage that actually is marked in my Bible. Some of you maybe do the same thing you like write in your Bible when God speaks to you through a passage you write in there, and you, I put the date, April 30th, and I go back and I think, what happened then? Why this passage? This is a passage that I've used and maybe many of you have used, right? We've used it when we gather to pray for a friend's healing. But God has also used this passage to remind me that you need to gather with people to pray. You need to pray. In general, he, this is one of those passages that reminds me to come back to him to pray. It reminds me to be faithful in my prayer. It reminds me that, that we need each other, that I need other people. Church, you have to remember, I'm going to lay this out there, be careful. This is, I'm a regular guy. I'm like a regular person, okay? I struggle, I wrestle, I lose, I win sometimes. I'm a regular human. I fail. There's nothing exceptional about me. And so maybe that's why this passage actually sticks out for me. It talks about real people stuff that's practical. It talks about it starts actually talking about if you're in trouble, if you're happy, you need to pray. Both situations for us, 
I think we're taught this. We try to teach our kids this. We're strong, reliant, self-reliant people. We can accomplish things on our own. We don't need any other people. We don't need people. But what does this first part say? It says, when times are tough, pray. So what does it say? These are maybe some of the things that are tough in your life. Sickness, right? Hard. Financial stress. Broken relationships. More life stress. Maybe it's kids are stressful for you. Maybe there's other things. Grandkids. Grown kids. Maybe there's work things that are stressful. And what do we do in those stressful times? If you're like me, sometimes you're like annoyed at God maybe that this happens. Why does this happen? God, why are you letting this happen? How can you let something like sickness happen in my family? Why would you let death happen? Why are financial struggles something that I have to deal with? Or why do relationships in my life break down? We focus on these things and we, we, uh, we think about ourselves and we don't think about what it looks like to reach out and what, what happens. What are the feelings that start to, to come? We feel alone. We feel depressed maybe. We question God. How could you let this happen? We think that nobody likes us because we haven't told anybody. We grit our teeth like we're taught we can solve this on our own. And we eliminate everybody else from our life because, and God in many situations because we're annoyed at him that he would let this happen to us. And so we feel more and more and more distant from God and in turn we feel more and more and more distant from the people that are around us that are caring for us, that want to care for us, that we're actually called to pray with. But James calls us to that. He says pray, pray even when times are tough. These are examples and maybe you have other examples. You have other things that you could add to this that make your life hard. But pray and seek guidance, seek comfort, seek peace, seek joy, acceptance, direction, life. The things that a relationship with God offer. The things that when we're close to him we know is real, that we're receiving from a faithful God. Be faithful in your need for the things that God offers. Pray in submission to a God that controls, a God that's a part of, a God that wants to be in relationship with you. Pray, and then it says pray when we're happy. This is easy, right? Maybe for some of you it's easy, but for me it also causes the other side of it. You know, pray when the things are good, health, when you don't have to think about your health, financial ease, right? Your health, you're like, wow, I've been taking care of myself. I've been eating good. Ex some of you exercise, I don't, but some of you do, right? Financial, I've been good at managing my money. We're, you know, I'm get, I work hard, so I got a raise. Strong relationships. Less life stress, maybe your kids behave. <laughs> Don't get too personal. Right? But what do we do? Then we're like, we pat ourselves on the back. Good job. Good job, Mark. You've been working hard. You've been doing the things, and now your life is good. Instead of praying and glorifying God for the good things, we forget. And James is saying, yeah, don't forget, even in times like that, to pray that the God who is restoring our hearts and transforming our lives from the inside is also one that's in control of all of the situations. The ever-present God that is a part of our every daily life. Everything, all of the things. He's a part of our lives, good and bad. Hard and easy, fun and mundane. James is like exhorting us, almost like he'd be like, smarten up. Maybe he's, that's how I feel like he's talking to me. He's telling me, he's, he's asking me to acknowledge that there's hard things and there's good things and I have a faithful God and worship a faithful God who's faithful. And if I read through the Bible, he's faithful in the Old Testament. He's faithful in my story and he's faithful in yours and he's gonna continue to be faithful. So pray, give glory to God. I do take some comfort in reading this because he didn't, James didn't know me. But at the time when he wrote it, the people needed to know this, and so I'm similar to the people that he's speaking to. I need the same reminder. It convicted me as well. It reminded me and motivated me to pray. The next few verses, I think, are a challenge because we reread them and assume that it says, if we gather the elders together and pray, if we anoint with oil, we will be physically healed. If we offer up prayers and ask God for healing, it'll happen. 
almost like a foolproof thing. If we gather people together, this is what will happen. But I think that when we read this, we assume that James is only talking about physical healing. But as I did like discovery and read books and, and people that have forgotten more things than I know about this ver- these verses, I realized that they're on a spectrum as well. They would probably say that if, if we look at the book of James, we can't only think of this passage as physical healing because that wasn't how James wrote. And so when I look at this, I think that um, James speaks to inner transformation as well as physical. He, he speaks about inner transformation, what God is doing on the inside, spiritually, in our lives, will reflect our actions. It will reflect on how we behave. It will reflect on the healing that's happening, the renewed life, our results of what God is doing. So when we're faithful in allowing God to transform our lives, to change us, to make us new, to change our lives from the heart outward, He'll heal us spiritually. And James asks us to pray in faith, to be faithful in our prayer, to believe a God who's faithful will continue to be faithful when we're faithful and pray. He might heal us physically. He might heal us right away even. But it might mean that in his timing he heals us whenever that happens to be. You have to also remember that James, being Jesus' brother, is using Jesus as a frame of reference, right? He followed Jesus around and saw Jesus work, and he saw Jesus heal people. But he also saw Jesus physically heal people and spiritually heal people. If you remember in Mark 2 when the disciples bring this man paralyzed and there's so many people in the house that they, like, dig through the roof and they lower him down, and do you know that Jesus doesn't just say, hey, pick up your, hey, can you move, like, okay, you're healed, like, He first, actually, when you read Mark 2, he first spiritually heals him. Your sins are forgiven, he says. And so then he realizes that the guy doesn't get up and walk. So, oh yeah, yeah, take up your mat, you can walk. The frame of reference that James uses is that Jesus heals spiritually as well as physically. We know that that when James talks about this, he's watched Jesus heal people spiritually. This is the context that he's using. He saw Jesus heal people, and that's the reason that he came, is to heal them spiritually. That's the reason that he died on the cross. That's, church, this passage is a reminder to be faithful, to pray, to follow after God, to to bring our good and our bad before him. It's a reminder to gather together with one another. It's a reminder that we actually need each other to pray, to gather with each other. But most importantly, it's a reminder that God cares most about the healing of our hearts, about our spiritual well-being. If we're only speaking about physical healing when this whole book is about spiritual transformation, uh, we would be off base. And I think that in this passage, it reminds us that this healing, this transformation is about all of us, is about uh, the wholeness of his disciples, God's creation. We're at different points on this journey, but we're all seeking to be transformed, to be healed at some level by God. The next section of this passage is an encouragement and a challenge to me. Verse 17 starts with Elijah was a human being. Some translations say was a real person or was real. But in all of the descriptions, it just says, and he prayed, right? Even as we are. So a regular human, even as we are, and he prayed earnestly. God used a regular human like Elijah. If you go to 1 Kings 16, 17, 18, 19, you'll read about his story. It's pretty unique. God speaks to him in different ways. He acknowledges God as a faithful God, and Elijah is faithful in his prayer. So God uses him. And if you read in this section, God uses him. Maybe some of you farmers want to go to this passage and see exactly what Elijah's life was about. Uses him to stop the rain and uses him to start the rain. Pretty amazing. Right? Right? But God uses a regular person who prayed faithfully. 
A faithful God using a faithful prayer. God gave him strength. He gave him skills. He gave him wisdom. He gave him the things that he needed for the situations that God put him in. Church, the reason that this passage is real for me and encouragement for me is not because I have ever done that, stopped the rain or started the rain. I can't do that. I wish that that would be my story. But if I tell you my story, it would start with Mark, a human like you, only maybe more insecure and broken than you. True news. Real. That's legit. I worry. I'm afraid. I'm insecure. I get mad, maybe yesterday, at a son who was pushing me that way. Okay? I fail. I feel inadequate a lot of the time. I don't always do devotions or pray regularly. I sometimes remember to give God the glory when things are good. And I often try to solve problems on my own when things aren't great. Okay? I forget, and I don't appreciate the great community that God has put around me, and I forget to share with them and challenge them and allow them to challenge me. I don't always let people speak into my life. And the list could continue. But church, my prayer is that every day God uses me, even in my insecurities, in my um, brokenness. So my prayer is that in the day that God uses me and opens doors and I have eyes to see, I'll be personal with you today. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Lots of you don't know this, but I serve as the chaplain for our Lethbridge Hurricanes. So it's been like six or seven years that I got to do that. I also serve as their mental health champion. I can't really define what that really looks like, but that's also what I do. I'll be honest with you, I know very little about hockey. I don't really skate well at all. I, can, I do have a mean slap shot in floor hockey, but that's about it. Okay, I, I'll actually tell you, this is some of you will realize how little I know, I cheer for the Canucks, okay? Thank you. Right there, see? Stick together. But, so, so, church, I get to do this. This is not, like, I'm not a hockey, I didn't grow up in the hockey world. I don't have special connections in the hockey. I don't understand the hockey culture. I'm learning, but God has opened doors for me to be a part of this. This is not in my comfort zone, okay? That, that is not something that I'm comfortable doing, but God opens doors for me to be a part of something that's uncomfortable for me. I don't have the language, I don't know the people, and God opens doors. I have a chance regularly, I send a text to some kids and say, let's do chapel, some of our hurricanes, and they say, when? When are you gonna be here? Let's do it. So I show up and they invite me into their change room, and I do chapel right there. Or I show up after a game and they, I'm allowed to walk right into their change room. I have now had opportunity to do weddings for Hurricanes players and staff. I have had opportunity to speak life uh, into families um, and walk alongside parents and players and siblings and have been invited into families. I've also had opportunity to um, walk along tragedy and in fact, in Lethbridge, I've had opportunity, invited by Lethbridge Minor Hockey, which is not Hurricanes, to speak to other hockey teams because of my connection. Again, you have to remember, I'm not a hockey person. I don't know the hockey world. I, in fact, didn't even grow up in Lethbridge, so the hockey people don't even know who I am. And God is opening doors. I had an opportunity this last year to do a funeral for a, a hockey um, person in our community and got to speak some hope to 1,500 people in our community. And you have to understand, church, this is not my world. And God uses me, Mark, a regular human, a person like you, um, an insecure, maybe I'll describe some of you, insecure, afraid, scared, all of the things, person, to do extraordinary things. An ordinary person to do these things. That's what I love about this passage is Elijah, a human who prays, God uses to do extraordinary things. Mark, a human, reluctantly sometimes because I can be stubborn and pull my hat down and put my glasses on and walk through Costco and you don't recognize me, not talk to anybody and, and not acknowledge the fact that God is calling me to situations 
open my eyes and allow God to use me in my weakness. And I have seen God show up with words, scripture, people, all sorts of things, purely on the grounds of a faithful prayer that says, God, open doors. And I walk through them most of the time when I don't ignore them. And God uses me. Church, these are the things that we're called to do. Pray. This passage is about prayer. Pray faithfully, always. And God will use us. Elijah is an example of God using a regular faithful prayer to do exemplary things. What sort of things is God calling you out of your comfort, out of your um, insecurities to do because that's what he wants you to do? What sort of things is he asking you to step into? Pray about, step into, so that he can make himself known to you. That he can transform you. With the end of this book and this chapter and the passage, James gets practical. Pray, church. Pray for each other. Pray alone. Pray together. Pray for others. Pray that no one quits. We heard that last week from from, uh, Pastor Dave. Pray for perseverance for each and for everyone, for all of you. Pray for the souls and the forgiveness of sins of everybody. He calls us to pray, to be in relationship to pray. He calls us to be together, to gather, to pray. He calls us to pray that God heals physically and that God heals spiritually. He assures us that we have a faithful God who hears the prayers of the faithful and will answer. Right? It says, uh, whoever to, um, in this passage, I'm not going to find it now. <laughs> but he says, when we pray, God will answer. He'll show up. He'll be there. He assures us that God hears our prayers. He calls us to be in relationship with each other. James says, be in relationship so that you know, so that you'll share, so that you pray. Be in relationship with each other. But he also says, be in relationship with God. Faithful relationship. Pray. Have conversation. This is the scripture that someone read to me this week. It's from Ephesians 6. It's Paul writing to the Ephesians. And and this translation that you're going to read is from the message. But it calls us to keep on. We're called to support each other, to love each other, to pray for all of those that have given up. It says, in the same way, prayer is essential in this, ongoing warfare. You need to know, like, the passage right before this is about putting on the full armor of God, Paul acknowledging that our battle is is real, that the battle for our souls, for our lives is, is one that's real and spiritual. And so he says, put on all of this armor, but he ends it with, make sure you pray Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and your sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. We're called to be in relationship, to support each other, to love each other, to pray for each other. James calls us to faithful prayer so that God can continue transforming us, continue making us new. This week, in preparation for the end of this series on James and this message, I have four questions for you to contemplate. These are the four things that I want you to think about and pray about and and allow God to work. They're on the backs of your bulletin. So if this screen all of a sudden disappears and you don't and you don't have them to pray, they're on the back of the bulletin. But here they are. What situations, good or bad, are you not giving over to God? whether they be good and giving God the glory for the great things that are going on in your life and the little things and the great things and the mundane things that you can be thankful for or the bad things, the hard things that you actually need to lay before him. What are those things? Maybe there's a way that God wants to heal you. How is that? 
Maybe it's physically, maybe it's spiritually, maybe there's something in your, in your life that through this series God has said, that's something I want to change and needs to be transformed. Maybe it's this, how is God asking you to stretch yourself in life situations? Maybe that's significant because we choose, we, I'll say I choose, tendency to choose, the path of least resistance, the easiest path. Right? How is God asking you to stretch yourself to sometimes do things that are hard, that take us out of our comfort zone, that make us feel inadequate so that we can't do it on our own power? And God is transforming us. And who is God asking you to pray for? Maybe there's people in your life, in your families. I got to pray with a young man in the first service who just wanted to pray for his family. Maybe there's people that you need to pray for, that you need to lift up. Maybe it's a spouse or kids or family, but who is it? Maybe a neighbor. Who is it that God is asking you to pray for? We're going to close. Um, I'm going to ask the, uh, the team to come forward. Um, for those of you that are, that are watching live, um, please join us in prayer. But uh, we have, through this whole series, invited people to come forward and pray. Uh, whether it be with us or alone, but to come forward and pray. And today we want to do the same. And there's going to be a few of us standing on the sides ready if you'd like to pray with us or we could pray for you or we could be with you as you pray. But maybe God is calling you out and, and, and this is the place that you need to pray and stepping out into something that's uncomfortable and coming here before him on your own and praying that God... Uh, help you, that God convict you, that God continue to transform, continue the work of transformation that he's started in your life. But I want you to be courageous. I want you to uh, allow God and allow God to work and allow God to speak to you and I want you to listen for what he's trying to do in your life. It's different. It's going to be different, your transformation than mine. But allow God to do that. Be courageous to step out into uncomfortable into the places where you feel insecure, with, in relationship with people. But allow God to transform you, to restore you, to heal you the way that he wants to. Mark, thank you so much. Pointing us to James and calling us to prayer. So let's stand together and sing. And if, any of you, all of you who want to come forward and pray with someone, there'll be people in front on both sides, or you can just come up by yourself too. That works as well. We're going to sing a couple songs as we pray. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees, O oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things, O oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not our souls to another give us clean hands give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another we bow our hearts we bend our knees oh spirit come we turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idol. Give us clean hands, give us pure.
bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us know. song is a really interesting one. It calls us to, to turn to the God of Jacob. What a great story. What a great idea that is. If you think about who Jacob is, he's the guy who got it wrong almost all the time. His life is failure after failure after compromise after compromise. And yet we're called to follow the God of Jacob, the God of second chances, the God of unpromising material, the God who reaches to us in our weakness and does fantastic and wonderful things. As we sing this next song, please feel free to come forward and pray still. Jesus Messiah. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and he carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing jesus messiah name above
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Jesus Messiah, hope for the world. He is our hope. And we are a people of hope, bringing hope to the world. And one of the ways that's evident among us as a church is through our generosity. In fact, as Christians, it's through our generosity that we are a people of hope. And one way that's evident for us as a church here at the Ephraim Lethbridge is the generosity that we show during the Advent season. We have a tradition here. We celebrate Advent Conspiracy. And for those of you who are new, Advent Conspiracy is a way that we redirect some of our Christmas spending to help address some significant needs in our community and in our world. And we've done all kinds of things from helping with fresh water in Africa and South America to addressing, doing poverty intervention programs here in Lethbridge. And so a variety of programs. And last year, we chose to partner with Compassion Canada to address child poverty in Nicaragua. And so that was a project that we took on last year. And how we did that was we gave towards addressing the op or covering the operational costs of a child survival program in Lyon, as well as we, get, we gave money to help cover costs for construction costs for sort of learning centers, one in El Viejo, as well as Maderas Negras. And so we gave generously towards that to build new classrooms and new kitchen and a new bathrooms in those places. And you responded. We responded. We gave generously to cover those costs. And last spring, I reported that construction had started on some of the facilities there in El Viejo and Maderas Negras. But as some of you, if you follow what's happening in our world, and we've even prayed about it here as a congregation, you know that things happened in Nicaragua we did not expect. In April, political unrest moved towards protests, which moved towards rebellions and riots. And thousands of people had to flee Nicaragua. And hundreds of people were killed. And so that construction had started, but we hadn't heard anything in the meantime since that time. Well, just recently, I got an update. And so I'm here to share what is happening in Nicaragua. We were helping support a child survival program in Lyon. And I want you to know that they did have to suspend the program during this time because it was too dangerous for the mothers and the children to come to the location where that program was meeting. But I just found out recently, they sent some pictures, and this is one of those pictures, where in August, this picture was taken then, they started meeting once again and started up, and it was safe enough for the mothers to show up there once again. And so this is a picture of them having a class and they have a variety of classes there. In the next slide, we have a picture of a birthday party that is going on in that same center. And so they're having birthday parties, which is part of the life of the community to celebrate the life of the children. I want you to know that Lyon was one of the hardest hit cities in all of Nicaragua with this riding. And so it's very encouraging to know that mothers and children can get back outside and they can be in this place. A year ago, I was telling you about a learning center in El Viejo that Ken and I got to visit firsthand. And this was a picture that I showed you last year. It's a picture of the classrooms, and they were not in very good condition. In fact, they were downright unsafe. They were made of sticks that were found, they were made of tarps, they were made of canvas, they had tin roofs that were caving in. And in this picture, you can see the dirt floors that during the raining season were turned to mud. There was unsafe electrical, 
in the building, in these facilities. And so they needed to really address this. This is what it looks like today. That construction, yes. This is an amazing story of what's happened in El Viejo and Madeiras Negras. The workers were committed to this project to helping make it sure it happened. And during all of the unrest and all the chaos and all the violence, the workers kept doing the construction. And they completed it 100%. The classrooms are all done, the, the bathrooms are all done, the kitchen's all done. And not only that, you can see exactly. We got the walls, we got the floors, we got safe electrical, we got secure building. And in the next slide, you will see the children are going to school into the learning centers once again. And so we're really excited, and it's your generosity, it's our generosity to the church that was able to make that happen and to make a difference in our world and in people's lives. It's amazing what one less Christmas sweater or maybe a few less stuffing stuffers can make in our world and changing people's lives. We are a generous church. We celebrate Advent Conspiracy. Next week's the beginning of Advent. And we're going to be announcing a new project for this year. And this week, I want you to go away and I want you to think about how are we going to be spending our money this Christmas? And as part of that conversation, I want you to talk with each other and your families and say, and, and, and yourself, to God, pray about this. About how much of this could I be redirecting to make a difference in people's lives like what we saw up here? We're going to be talking about that next week. And we are generous people, and just like last year, we're going to do the same thing. We had two goals. One was to give generously to Advent Conspiracy, and the other was to give generously to our general revenues in our budget. And last year, we set that goal, and we met that goal, and we know that we can do it again. So we're going to have the same two goals this year, to give generously to Advent Conspiracy, as well as to give generously to our regular budget. And just for those of you who may not know this, on average, every week, we need to um, take in about 53500 to follow through with the commitments that we as a church have said, this is what we're committed to this year. So that's something to keep in mind. We have many ways that you can give financially, and if you want to know more about that, you can look in your bulletin. It's listed in there of different ways, or you can go to our website, efreelethbridge.ca. God is working. Thank you for your generosity. Let's continue to be generous. We have a chance right now to give our offerings, and so I'm going to call the ushers forward, and you can give your offerings as well as put your encouragement cards in, in the baskets as they go by. Let's pray. God, I thank you for how you are moving in this world. I thank you for what you're doing in Nicaragua. I thank you for the encouraging news in the midst of all that chaos that you continue to bring hope to that place. Thank you for how you've used our generosity to be able to Make a difference in children's lives, in families' lives, in parents' lives. And we pray right now that even in this offering, that you will just take this and multiply it for your kingdom's work. We do this because we love you and we want to glorify you. We pray this in your name, our Jesus, Jesus, Savior, and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing as we take the offering.
from the Lord. Yeah, let's sing this out. I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord. Let's sing it again. I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord. I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord. Oh my God, He will not delay my refuge and strength. gathered together today and it's been so encouraging so fun to hear about those of you that have served in the Christmas production this year or who have brought someone with the words from Ephesians 1 that Paul writes to that church have been in my head today and the very first verses for this reason ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people I've not stopped giving thanks thank you for serving this community. Thank you for coming together as family and reaching out and coming alongside to tell the story of Jesus Christ this season. It is so good to be in family together. I'm gonna to have you stand, let's pray. And um, I'm gonna use some of Paul's words today to pray for us. Jesus, thank you for your brother James. Thank you that you showed up to him, you spoke to him and James is speaking to us and the words have been challenging and there have been Sundays where I have left here going who can actually do this but Jesus you said if we have the faith of a mustard seed we could move mountains and so we come to you today with our mustard seed and say move us shape us maybe we a people that always gives thanks May we be thankful for this family and may we remember to pray for our brothers and sisters in our midst. You've placed us alongside each other on purpose. Remind us to pray. And Father, I ask that through the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, may you give the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know your son better. May we understand Emmanuel more fully. Open the eyes of our hearts that we might be enlightened, that we might know the hope that you have called us to and the riches of the glorious inheritance that we have as a holy people. And Jesus, may we understand your incomparable grace that is poured out over us. And may we stand in it in the fullness of your power because you are great and good and faithful and we're yours may we experience this reality in our lives this week open our eyes may we see where you are at work and may we step in with courage because you are faithful we love you and we pray this in your name amen have a great week family see you next sunday Thanks for joining us today. We're so glad we got to spend that time with you. Our prayer is that the time spent on the screen with us is just part of your faith journey. We grow and are gifted to be in community, and we hope that if you live close to our Lethbridge campuses, you'll take time to join us in person. There's nothing like the local community church. If you're not close to Lethbridge, we'd love to hear from you and see you connect in a local church community near you. 
If you have any questions, use our website or mobile app to send in a connection card and let us know how we can connect with you, how we can be praying for you or be in touch. One of our church family would love to reach out. You also might have noticed we took an offering during our service. So if you want to give back to this local church, visit the website for your online giving options. We can't wait to see you again in person or online. Have a great week.